call David Seymour. Mr Speaker, it is an enormous privilege to live in a society that benefits from 800 years of common law that has given us, among other rights and freedoms, freedom of speech. And it started, perhaps most colloquially, as the simple idea that sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, in actual fact, uh, what has evolved is the idea that sometimes words can hurt. And over that long period of time, an intricate network of defences evolved so that people could, for instance, defend themselves against damage to their reputation that was done deliberately, that was untrue, and where the audience might be led to believe that it was true. That is our inheritance. 800 years of trying to figure out how exactly to protect freedom of speech uh, on the one hand and people's right not to be unfairly maligned on the other. And another great privilege that everybody in this room has uh, is membership, or at least on the floor, membership of this House of Representatives. And to use the second privilege to destroy or at least erode the first one in the way this bill does is something that I cannot support and therefore must vote against this bill. Mr Speaker, this bill is a case study in bad lawmaking. All of the elements in making a bad law exist. Not since we microchipped dogs in the hope that it would prevent a particularly egregious dog event uh, has there been such a bad law uh, before this House. First you had the high profile and really quite disgraceful events. Then you had the discovery that, in actual fact, the laws in place had not been properly used by the agency in place to prevent the harms that occurred there. And then you had the knee-jerk reaction from the politicians where they said, we must do something. This bill is indeed something. Therefore, we will pass this bill and it must be the right thing to do. And what exactly does this bill do? Well, the first thing that it does is that it introduces a set of communications principles that might be appropriate if we were about to embark on a school camp, but are not appropriate for the governance of four and a half million people, many of whom are adults, and the children uh, among them are the responsibility of adults. Uh, it says that you cannot offend somebody. So, for instance, would Flight of the Concord song, I'll Be the Racist Dragon, be offensive if it was communicated online? Uh, well, we are told, in defence of the badly burnt Albanian boy from last week, uh, that, of course, this law would never be used in such a silly and unsensible way. That's the problem with the law. It gives no protection. We're supposed to rely on the beneficence of the enforcers. Mr Speaker, that is bad lawmaking. If you were to say, happy 31st, Liz, would that be giving away information uh, that you should not reveal of a personal nature uh, about another person? Would that be a bad example? How much of, this, of these bad examples will actually end up discouraging uh, freedom of speech and what you might call a chilling effect? As I said in my maiden statement to the House, it is ce qu'on va et ce qu'on ne va pas not just what is seen, but all of the unseen expression that will now not occur because of the chilling effect uh, that the communications principles and the enforcement of it, even if not quite criminal yet, you understand, you're going to be OK, if the enforcement of it by the approved agency is brought to bear. Perhaps that's why Voltaire said that I defend your right to the death to say what you say, even when those are things that he himself uh, disagrees with. It's a sad day in this House, Mr Speaker, when you have to rely uh, on lo lots of dead frogs to stand up for your civil liberties. You probably won't be able to say that uh, either very soon. And it might be worthwhile to have this law if we truly believed that it was going to reduce harm and protect people. 
But in actual fact, as soon as you start to look at the contradictions, you can see it will make little, if any, difference uh, for reducing harm for people online. And where there is genuine harm to be mitigated, uh, you will find that there were much, much simpler, more straightforward ways of doing it uh, with far fewer side effects. For example, we are concerned that children will bully each other. And so, the idea is to introduce criminal sanctions. But of course, you understand we're not really introducing criminal sanctions to children because they'll go through the youth court. So somebody might ask, why would you make a law that you did not intend to be properly enforced? Or for another contradiction, uh, you might ask, how quickly do most viral phenomena on the web take place? Well, under this law, you have at least 96 hours of back and forth before any kind of order can be enforced. And so you might ask yourself, how does this seriously address the problem uh, that most people face? Well, I suspect, uh, Mr Speaker, that there's very little coincidence in the fact that it is the youngest members of this House who are most opposed to it. It is fundamentally a generational conflict, uh, a, a law imposed by people who are not digital natives, uh, who do not understand how the internet works, uh, on users of the internet who do. The pace of development uh, on the internet is so rapid that in actual fact the incentive for the hosts of content is to give good experiences. If it is true that harm is being done, then the one person who has both the incentive and the means to rapidly mitigate that harm uh, is the host, whether that be uh, the uh, Facebook or the AskFM or the Twitter or whomever else hosts the website. For the same reason that harmful digital communication becomes exponentially greater, uh, those people have the tools uh, to mitigate it. But you don't hear that from the government or from the supporters of this bill. There's a moralising tone from them that if you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to fear. That these vague principles will not be enforced for silly reasons, you understand. So long as you're sensible and you're doing nothing wrong, it won't be used against you. Uh, and that, Mr Speaker, is something that I, I cannot explain any further. Anybody who does not see the problem with that construction is incapable of having it explained to them. But for those who do understand it, uh, that is why it is critical that this type of legislation becomes rarer and eventually obsolete from being introduced to this House. Of course, there are real concerns. Nobody denies that incitement to suicide and revenge porn are serious dangers. And they are dangers that have come, to some extent, from technological advances. Well, it would have been very simple, and I have to thank the Labour Party for supporting my SOP last week, to simply say that in the Crimes Act, it is a crime to make an intimate digital recording and distribute it without that person's consent, particularly if your aim uh, is to do harm. That's the right way uh, to do it. Uh, I have to thank uh, Claire Curran, who approached me early about opposing this bill, and I apologise that we weren't more, more proactive. I think we might have been able uh, to defeat it. Uh, ditto to some of my colleagues in the Greens who have bravely decided today uh, that they will oppose this bill and support uh, good lawmaking. I should probably compliment some of my friends in the National Party who have severe concerns about this bill, but I do not wish to get them in trouble, Mr Speaker, so I will not do that. In conclusion, this is fundamentally about the quality of the laws that we make in this House. Do we wish to make laws that are fit for purpose, that address the problem with the smallest possible number of side effects? Or do we wish to make populist knee-jerk laws that will do very little to achieve their intended outcomes and yet have enormous unintended consequences and do great damage uh, to the rights and freedoms that have evolved in our society over several hundred years? Do those of us who have the dual privilege uh, of benefiting from 800 years of common law and the freedom of speech that it is intricately delivered and the privilege of being in this House want to use the second privilege to tear down the second one. Unfortunately, it would seem that far too many of my colleagues in this House do. And as a final thought, Mr Speaker, it won't escape members that we often have a reputation 
in public opinion surveys as being very untrustworthy. And can I suggest to members that we will be back debating this, discovering that we overpromised uh, in terms of our ability to reduce harm through digital communications, and that we have under-delivered uh, in terms of protecting rights and liberties. If we were to reverse that equation by opposing this bill, we might very quickly improve that situation. Thank you, Mr Speaker.